Testing? Cool. Hey, guys. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Kashishian. I'm a uh, full stack developer from New York. Uh, and my talk is titled Cohesive OSM Experiences Across the Screen and Paper. So the goal of this presentation is to empower you guys to uh, be able to use paper PDF outputs and inputs in your applications more. Um, one thing to note at the beginning, I am an engineer, not a designer. So the presentation layout here is, the aesthetics are really lacking. It's something like the NSA PRISM presentation that you may have seen earlier in the week. So uh, please bear with me in that point. So um, let's begin. So again, my full stack developer in New York City. Um, I didn't have a large amount of GIS experience prior to last year, but I was uh, able to get involved in this product. It's been a really fun time, and I've learned a lot. Um, I'm the lead developer at a product called Karis Geo. And the marketing talk for that is it helps businesses, NGOs, and governments collect and visualize and share geospatial data in less developed and emerging frontier markets. Um, I think the better question to ask there is how can we leverage web apps to put the power of GIS into the layperson who may not have experience with a, a more sophisticated technical suite? Um, this is a completely fresh code base that I developed in Rails 3, Postgres, uh, Leaflet, which I'm a big fan of and I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, Backbone.js, and of course, OSM. Uh, it's open sourced at the Karis Geo repository, so anybody is welcome to uh, fork our code, launch your own instance of Karis Geo for your own data collection needs. Um, I deploy typically on Heroku. You could be up and running around 10 minutes after setting your environmental variables. Um, so what exactly is Karis Geo is probably what you're wondering about. So I would assume that some of you are familiar with uh, products like uh, Survey, Monkey, Poll Daddy, um, in the frontier markets developing world, people are collecting data too, but they don't have access to those types of tools because computers aren't as available, uh, bandwidth isn't as cheap, uh, smartphones aren't always available. So the typical uh, thing that is said to these people who want to collect data in the uh, Liberias, the Nigerias, is that just use a Word, Word, Excel, and a printer and just make it happen. Um, you guys can probably guess that that leads to some pretty unstructured data and lots of problems down the road. Um, you can't compare patterns across years, uh, months, and it can get really ugly. Um, so that's just a survey just containing textual data. What if you wanted to collect spatial data as well? As we all know here, um, spatial data magnifies any challenges you have when you're dealing with data collection. Um, again, these people that we're working with do not have GPS units, do not have uh, GPS-enabled smartphones to be able to tag places as they go. Um, we take for granted here in America. Um, everybody's got an iPhone 4S, 5, Android phones. Uh, this is, we're in San Francisco, I'm from New York. Everybody's used to that kind of thing, just being there, and why not just make a cool mobile app that sucks everything in, you know, in place and get the job done. Um, so we had to come from a different angle and expect that the system is going to be used by people who are, are gonna be using a pen and paper, maybe. Really simple stuff, uh, back to basics. We can call it analog inputs. Also, uh, we're not gonna be able to train these people extensively because of the distances between us. Um, we need an intuitive system that is boiled down to the basics of GIS. Uh, hi to the Esri guys, but we are not ArcGIS. We're not trying to be those guys. We're trying to do something different, be lightweight, and bring all the awesome work that you guys do in GIS to uh, the person who's out there just trying to get their job done in a police station or a violence observatory in uh, frontier markets. So the overall point of this slide is we want to get more people capturing geospatial data in paper formats and returning analytical value once collected. So again, some people might call us a more geospatial analog means to do things like Poll Daddy and SurveyMonkey. Here, you're able to create your own open schema with a variety of different um, input types, text, number, date, date time, add a note if you want to add a bit more specific information about what you're trying to collect. You'd be selecting your bounds. So if anybody's used field papers here, I bet there's a couple, you might notice that this tool is a bit uh, familiar to you. We, this is the predecessor or the successor product to field papers and walking papers. So we took over the great grid mapping tool that they had and brought it into Leaflet. Um, so you're gonna set your area up and then you'll notice that in those grid areas, um, you're able to set as many as possible. That's because a lot of times people want to distribute work across the police station or group that they're working in in Africa. So you're able to divvy up work in between the people that you are collaborating with. Um, 
this is a, we're trying to build a paper toolkit to empower people to get out there and collect data in the communities that matter to them. So what does this toolkit look like? So we need to be able to get uh, paper maps utilizing OSM out to groups of people in frontier environments. There's going to be no digital uh, component involved here. They're going to be going out to communities. Um, maybe it's door to door, business to business. I don't know. It's up to the people how they want to use the platform. Uh, we produce PDFs that uh, contain two parts, uh, an out overview PDF of the entire gridded area, and then specific pages for each gridded area that could be distributed to different parts of the group. And then we take the collection component. Uh, Microsoft Excel would typically be used, but we're actually producing PDFs that look like a spreadsheet, but you're really just filling in with a pen. Um, and then afterwards, after the data collection happens, people maybe come back to their cyber cafe where they work out of, or their police station where there's one person with a 3G dongle that can connect, um, bring in the data manually, as you see below, or they can uh, bring the data into a CSV template that we provide so we can do very fast parsing. It's a bit quicker. Um, when it comes to marking the geodata that's going to be present, we use Leaflet Draw in conjunction with Leaflet to um, be able to let people drop their points down, drop their lines down. We support three different types of geo entities, markers, points, uh, polylines and polygons for different types of things. For If you're collecting crime incident data, you're probably going to be using points. If you're talking about um, areas of deforestation that you want to notate, Probably going to be using areas, polygons. So we have a couple of different types that you guys are definitely familiar with. Uh, one thing that we've done to improve efficiency is build a super simple collaboration system. So anybody who has an email address can come onto your survey and start adding data alongside you. So if you do want to do that divvying up of different grids to different people, you're able to quickly amass all the data you need to do your analytics. So what happens when all the data comes in? What are you able to do with it? So previously, when people were doing surveys with Word and Excel, all they end up with is a tabular sheet of data, and they're going to look over it, maybe run some calculations. But what about um, using the power of geodata to more accurately show what's going on in their communities? So since we know the schema that you've created, you're then able to um, present uh, controls, typically in JavaScript, that make sense for dealing with the data that you've inputted. So over here, we have a couple different things. Uh, this is a survey of the 1854 uh, cholera outbreak in London. A couple different things we were tracking here. Uh, when the person died, uh, what was their occupation, how old were they, the duration of symptoms and days, um, and where their water was coming from. So with something like this, you're able to really drill down and see, um, can you show me all the people who were between 30 and 50 who were getting water from the Suffolk uh, water supply and uh, died in August of 1854. You can do things like that. Um, for anybody who's technical who's interested in how we're doing this, uh, we're using very common but popular uh, JavaScript controls like Select2 and JQ Range Slider to provide for easy dragging and dropping of, of how far of your ranges you'd like to be. Um, when it comes to putting this data out, you can keep it inside of your own groups or you can make it public uh, to anybody on the web. Uh, just a simple flick of a switch. And anybody out there uh, can embed it on their sites or just play around on their own. Um, or you can keep it to trusted colleagues. Uh, we don't want to keep this data that you collect locked down. We think it's important in our system and also other systems. So feel free to export to GeoJSON or uh, CSV files if you want to work with there. Um, we've had users bring it to Mapbox. Uh, sometimes people want to save data back into Excel for whatever needs. That's up to you. We do not want to keep your data siloed. So here's an example of somebody uh, who used Karish Geo to map uh, different types of ethnic graffiti in Kabul. And then they decided to uh, bring the, the data into Mapbox afterwards with our exports. Um, we encourage this type of collaboration. We think Mapbox is doing awesome work, especially in the leaflet area, uh, contributing so much. So we think these, this partnership of tools is really awesome. Um, here's another example of people using our PDF maps to uh, no, notate uh, different demographic areas in Aleppo, the Syrian Civil War. Um, as you can tell here, uh, this is a, a larger scale map put up on a wall. We do support large scale printouts, not just letter size of our PDFs. However, the, the problem is um, that many of us, are, I didn't realize, is that 
Most people don't have the ability to print these large scale A0 maps. Most people are going to be printing out A4s, letter sized, and then pasting it together with scotch tape. So for you engineers out there who are used to seeing your work only in a digital format on the web, it's really interesting to see your work that you produced uh, being displayed 5,000 miles away in the Middle East. It's a, it's a different kind of feeling. I think you guys would enjoy it. Um, if you don't like the preset map sizes that Mapfish print, which is what we're using here, uh, allows, you can make your own size. So whatever works for you. Uh, here's another example of people using uh, our printouts in a paste-it-together form, uh, mapping slums in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, we've done a, a fair bit of work in Africa so far, um, looking in Nigeria, Liberia, and uh, most of our usage has been there so far. Here's an example of, of something I found on the web recently, just as a demo of our platform. Um, so Mother Jones did a very large investigation, I believe, last year about mass shootings in America over a significant amount of years. Um, they provided an open data set. I saw the kind of things that they were tracking in their columns. I figured, why not try to bring it into our system and allow for more sorting and filtering? So I just took their CSV file, plugged it in. Um, they had latitude and longitude data, which was great. And this shows how you can use this in a journalistic sense. If you're trying to illustrate a story and want to allow people to really filter data and make their own conclusions about what you're doing, you can embed this onto your site and then have this kind of functionality right there. Uh, so this is the, my slide about the D word. So you've probably noticed that we're not trying to disrupt too much of an entrenched workflow in these places that we're dealing with, where um, things have been going the same way for a long amount of time. You don't want to just airdrop a new solution in that we create in New York City or San Francisco into a Liberian police station. Um, we think that's a way to not get engagement you don't want to change too much at one time. Instead, we're trying to integrate and improve incrementally bits and pieces of their workflow to help people out. Um, we've even approached the ideas of not even providing the analytical side of things uh, for certain scenarios and just providing an ability for people to drop things onto a map and store it and then give them access to data analytics like filtering and heat maps later. We just don't think you need to rush this process. You want to make it digestible improvements, not everything at once. Um, anybody who's been working in the development area in Africa knows that a lot of products do get sent there, a lot of money gets dropped in, and then nothing en ends up happening after six months because there's no continued need by the people there, the local engagement. There's none. So we do not want to be considered disrupting. We want to be improving in proper ways. So we learned a couple lessons, and I'd love to share them with you guys because it's been a really interesting 12 months. So anybody here who's engineers, uh, familiar with validation um, on the client side and the server side. Make sure you get data in safely and make sure it fits in with the structure of your system. So what about the problems when you're dealing with people who are giving your paper outputs to collect things and don't exactly know what they should be storing? You don't want those kinds of questions happening. You really should be explicit and make as, make as many questions answered before they go out as possible. So then when it comes to the data stage, the digitalization stage, things are not as ugly. You want to provide a really good sync between that paper and digital mash, mash up uh, as possible. So what we did, this is an example of um, just providing a simple legend and cues about how to enter in data in certain fields for, uh, for numbers and date times and just free text fields. Make it really simple. Don't think that they have to assume what you want when it comes to digitization. You want to make the person who's out there in the field already, already has enough problems on their hands talking with people and getting information. Let's try to make their lives easier. Um, more lessons learned. Uh, bandwidth in Africa, Middle East, South America is sometimes much different than what we're used to here. Um, bandwidth is expensive sometimes. A lot of people do not have access. We've had a lot of people uh, using our platform uh, in police stations the only internet access is a 3G dongle that is paid for out of somebody's personal funds. There is no Ethernet wired network there. Um, there is no station-wide Wi-Fi going on. So expect an unreliable connection. Expect a possibly bandwidth-restricted um, setup. Uh, so what we did was um, we made it so a lot of the client-side work can be happening, or querying can be happening client-side because we heard that sometimes people, when there's only one laptop and one access point in a police station, they pick up their laptop and they have to go see their superior and show them something in a different room, different part of the building. 
they bring the laptop up and want to go show something. With our system, since we do so much client-side querying, you're able to completely disconnect from the internet and still provide uh, filtering heat maps with the different sliders that I was showing you before. Um, is that going to scale for when you have 500,000 points? Probably no, but most of our surveys deal with lower numbers, 1,000 to 5,000 entities. Um, it's something to consider. We use a plugin called Backbone Query for that. Uh, it provides you with a MongoDB-like syntax to do queries like between, like, and things like that. Um, what happens if you're in an area where there's not going to be any permanent computer there at all? Then you're going to get into the thing of, how are we going to provide all the hard work that we did so far on the digital side to this person? Uh, something that I cooked up was something called Ecto.js, which is a wrapper for Phantom and Casper. Takes screenshots of your website and then stitches them into PDFs. Um, and then able to print them. Or if you want to do email attachments to somebody else, you're welcome to do that too. This is not really a scalable approach because anybody who's been working in browser side automation knows that these things take some time to spin up. But this is an option for you if you want to keep a very close match between your front end and your paper outputs. Another thing is uh, I glossed over the schema creation process at the beginning. It's not so much fun. You really have to spend time thinking about what are the best ways to store my data? And what are the correct input formats, the notations, things like that? Our hope is that when people see a cool survey um, in another country, that maybe it's in their industry, they want to they copy the results to their area. So somebody who sees a deforestation survey in Peru, um, maybe someone in Bolivia sees that, who's working in that space, and wants to do the same thing in their area. We provide a very easy link on the upper right-hand corner of each one of our public pages allowing people to fork that schema and build their own survey directly from there. All they have to do is change the area that they're working in, and then they instantly get the toolkit prepped for them. Very simple. It's about providing features relevant to your user group. Overall benefits. Uh, Karish Geo's reduced UI allows for a more diverse user group to get involved. Um, we are not trying to provide the power of ArcGIS. Again, we're trying to go for a much more lightweight, simple, easy to get up and running solution. We're trying to expose the previously siloed data that is inherent in a lot of these communities. Um, we take map data for granted here in America and the West. Um, a lot of places, all this really valuable data, it's stored in people's heads or in notebooks in office cabinets. It's not out there. So we're trying to push the whole idea of open data in other places because everybody can agree that it's a great thing. Um, also, since we're storing the data on our servers, you don't have to worry about people who are um, hosting their data in ArcGIS and laptops and things like that. Um, don't worry about the reliability, the backups. We're going to take care of that for you. And the portability, uh, allowing data that's collected in Nigeria to be passed to decision makers in other places is also really simple too. Just add them as a collaborator, and they get authorized access to the entire data set, can filter, and make those decisions. Um, since we launched in March of this year, We've had about 900 surveys created and over 390 user signups uh, done. And like I said, most of this work has been in the Middle East and Africa. So again, why get involved with paper? There's a lot of interesting problems in the developing world that can be solved with the work that we do here. Um, a lot of times, I think the bulk of the work is done in your web, applica app web applications already. Why limit yourself? Get yourself out to another medium, and now you get to reach a whole new group of people. I think it's a really interesting thing, dealing with paper and PDFs. If you asked me two years ago, how was I going to be outputting all these things, I would have been really confused uh, and think it's difficult. But there's some great benefits to getting involved here. Paper is familiar to a lot of people. It's reproducible. Copy shops all over Africa. And it's also inexpensive in a relative sense. Uh, the idea of distributing $50 Android smartphones to large groups of people in places might sound very cool to us here, but it's not always reproducible. So you've heard all the talk about Karish Geo. What does it do? So now this part of the talk is about how you guys are going to use Mapfish Print and other tools to get going on your own projects. Um, you've seen how we've used Mapfish Print to produce very simple PDFs with grids on top. I'm sure you're going to have your own ideas of what's cool and what's going to work for you. We're going to do a quick crash course in the Mapfish Print protocol. Um, this is a lightly documented Java component. Uh, extract, extracted out of the Mapfish Foundation for producing high-quality map files. It runs typically out of a Java Tomcat uh, servlet, or you can run it off the command line. Um, P 
PDF output, PNG output, or if you have something really special in mind, you can also dump to image magic if you need that. Uh, that's a newer feature of the suite. Um, it's a really undiscovered thing, in my opinion. There's only 50 stars for it on GitHub. I don't know why, because I think it's a really powerful tool. If you want to drop in solution for your own uh, platform that you can literally deploy in around five minutes and have something up and running and just needing a bit of configuration, this is the tool for you. Uh, it's from camp to camp, uh, Landcare Search, and Swiss Topo. The, the maintainers are extremely accessible and love talking about the product. Um, really fun group of guys and get pull requests in really quickly. It's a small team. For a small team, it's a great tool. Um, Karastio is very small. I'm the lead engineer, and I have a couple consultants who work under me. So for us, we did not want to get into the weeds with dealing with creating our own printing suite. Definitely not. The basic premise with this is that Mapfish Print extends your existing work to another medium. So here's the highly complicated set of procedure. Some of you may have seen WordPress's like, famous five-minute install. This is how complicated it gets for when you're dealing with Mapfish Print. You clone the repository, then you go through a Java build process, downloads a bunch of 200 megabytes worth of things in typical Java fashion, and then you get a file that results that you can upload to your server. A great way to get moving on Mapfish Print is to go with Elastic Beanstalk, which is Amazon's uh, deployment uh, container for, for Java apps and other things. Or you can go even cheaper and use DigitalOcean. Uh, for experimental purposes, you can get up and running with a server for about $5 a month. Or just run locally in your own network. It's fine, too. Just a side note, I am not your sysadmin here. Uh, if you do decide to, to deploy to an Amazon microserver, please do not contact me when it blows up under production usage. <laughs> your auto-scaling policy, that's what that's there for. When you get up and running, you'll be able to view that web page, because MapFishPrint is just operating a web server. You'll be able to go to a test page and start kicking out things right there. It's really, really quick. The longest part of the procedure will be building. So how do you do MapFish print configuration? Um, there's two parts to it. Some of you may be familiar with YAML. Um, that's the configuration language on the server side for setting up um, what kind of layouts you want to be doing, landscape orientation, page size. Again, you can set your own page sizes. Um, and then the spec, that gets passed into the configuration file on every request. And you're able to set up, I want to use this tile map, or this tile set, for this amount of this bounds. And I want to draw this amount of vector features on top. Anybody who's familiar with GeoJSON is seeing some similarities here with what we're using. This is uh, some processes taken from open layers, I believe, some of their vector styling. Um, and you're able to draw whatever you want. You want to use custom icons for your markers? That's fine. You just want to style and color uh, polygons? You can do that, too. Um, when it comes to editing on your own logos, scale markers, other things, that's going to be happening on the server side. So here's a very simple example of how you might use Mapfish Print on your web applications. Here's a form field. This is literally taken from the Mapfish Print demo. Um, it's a form field with a text area inside to block a JSON. You just start pushing out things here. Um, if you want to do JavaScript loops and figure out some way of creating a dynamic JSON blocks, you're able to do that. Um, but this is as simple as it gets. It's just HTML. Send the request over, and something comes back to you. So it's not an intensely complicated procedure. I feel like that's the way a lot of people think about producing PDFs these days. It's not that hard. This Procedure does work. However, once you get into a complicated spec file, you're going to get an HTTP 414 error uh, too long request, because things will get long if you're creating multiple pages of data. A more similar or a more smart procedure is to do something uh, back end with a post. A user clicks a print button. A back end generates a large spec file. I use JBuilder to, spec to template out my JSON. Then whatever HTTP library you want to use, I use Nestful, will send your JSON to that server. Uh, Mapfish Print responds back uh, with a JSON block containing the URL of the produced PDF, and then you just 302 your client to wherever that resource is. Um, if you have a situation like us where sometimes this data is sensitive, uh, don't, um, when you're putting your, your produced PDFs into an S3 bucket or something, just get expiring URLs afterwards, because you don't want these PDFs that may contain uh, police stations data exposable to anybody. Use expiring URLs to make things limited by access control. And also, for certain things, if you're going to be doing emailing of these PDFs, probably use a background worker, I would assume. Sidekick work for us. 
preventing abuse. So if you're worried about a renegade group of Brooklyn hipsters who want to map out artisanal cupcake shops or something, and you're thinking about that they're going to DOS your server because it's an open one, just uh, set up a whitelist. You can use host matching, IP matching to block anybody who doesn't belong there. Um, and when it comes to uh, internally abusing, don't abuse the OSM servers. If possible, make your files only once and then save them in S3 or something like that. Um, there's no need if you have static maps to again hit the OSM servers and take tiles. Let's try to maintain the infrastructure. Uh, so if you really like software packages that have a nautical or seafood theme, you'll want to integrate with a tool called Prawn, which is a very popular Ruby library, some of you may be familiar with, for producing uh, great PDFs. So here, um, you can make the toolkit that we talked about only one file as opposed to two. So when you're talking about using Prawn, it's just a very simple like Ruby DSL. Uh, you take, after creating your Mapfish PDFs, you'll be able to drop any files you want into the prawn PDF language, and then that file is simply inserted into the, that file that you're creating, and then you drop the prawn PDF file over to the person. So kind of went forward a bit. Um, you could do some of this data table work in Mapfish Prince protocol. I wouldn't recommend it if you're looking to maintain your hair. There's a lot of uh, gray hairs involved with dealing with YAML configuration, in my opinion. Uh, this is just some examples here of uh, what Prawn's language looks like. It's fairly legible in my opinion. So this is an example of some of our combo PDFs that we do with, with Mapfish and Prawn. Um, so on the browser side, after you, you can roll over uh, something and get information about that entity, what's involved with it, how do you translate that process to paper? It's a little bit different, right? Um, we provide a legend that's produced with Prawn, dumping out each one of the results. And then we draw uh, vectors on our Mapfish print PDF that correspond to whatever you're dealing with. Um, is this the, most, the best solution out there? No, this is an experiment. This is what, how, the problems we're trying to figure out with Mapfish print and our system. Um, but it is a way to get the power of GIS out to people uh, who do not have access to a computer, and that is many people. Um, so contributing to Mapfish print. So I've been trying my best to contribute to Mapfish Print, even though I don't have much Java experience. Again, the response time from the maintainers is really, really quick. I submitted a pull request two months ago, and it was in within 15 minutes. Uh, they're really a nice bunch of guys, really fun. It's a well-structured code base. As a person who's never worked with Java, this was a great introduction into working with them. Um, what have I worked on specifically? I've worked on uh, YAML samples, cleaning them up, because Mapfish has a great amount of samples to, to get you started with some documentation that was outdated. I built an option to disable scale locking because the problem with our system is that people are building all kinds of different area bounds for their surveys. Some people have rectangles that are very standard, like almost like a square. Some people are very, very wide. The problem that that was creating was that the built-in scales in that fish print were not really hooking in together with OSM's available scale. So I built a system where I built a, a little option inside of Mapfish print that allows you to pick just the best scale possible from OSM's Availables and get something that fits your page bounds as best as possible. The other thing I've worked on um, regarding S3 again is integration with JetSet, which is a cool Java uh, S3 library. If you don't want to be dealing with uh, saving of PDFs to S3 buckets um, on your app backend, I built a tool, this tool that allows you to do all that saving on the Mapfish print side. So it just cuts one step out of the process. Uh, what are my plans for Mapfish Print? Uh, build a CLI tool, command line tool, to automate changes of config YAML, because I've spent way too much time in Nano tweaking things one by one and testing it out. I really want to make that quicker. Font size scaling. Uh, right now on the overview maps and the sp sp uh, separate grid pages, the font size can vary dramatically, because I'm not able to independently set for each page what labels should be. Also, I think a configuration language to modify uh, the config file uh, server side from a web app would be really cool to be able to make more independent layouts. And also, getting a leaflet plugin, if anybody wants to collaborate with me on this, I think it'd be really awesome to make spec creation, which I said before can be a bit ugly if you're not familiar with JSON. Build a tool that'll just one click, and you get a PDF, a block for the spec that you can pass to your server. In closing, um, 
we think at Karis Geo that leaflet, mapfish print, and prawn is an amazing combination for extending the work that you guys are doing in GIS to other mediums. Um, it's about applying the concepts that you guys have in different ways. We really want you to take the leap and build the bridge to paper in your own projects. You guys are doing great work, and it's, it's a shame to not be able to extend that to more places. Again, we're open source. Take our code, adapt it for your own needs, and we love to see that, or submit pull requests just to us. Um, Special thanks to Vladimir at Leaflet. Uh, he's been a great uh, contributor. Well, he's the lead maintainer of, of Leaflet, and this product wouldn't be possible without him. Uh, I spoke to him this week, and he wishes he could have made it, but unfortunately could not. Um, but it's because of him that this product has, has gotten a success. Um, and if you want to contribute to more JavaScript projects, this is the place for you. Leaflet is awesome, almost about 5,000 stars. And uh, I've loved working on it. And it's, it's a really great tool. And the API is just absolutely amazing, as anybody who has worked with it already can see. Uh, if you'd like to check out our beta, karisgeo.com, uh, it's for you. It's free. Again, come on in. Start mapping out what's important to you. If you have any questions specifically about Mapfish Print, uh, there's my email address and my website. And feel free to contact me. I'd love to answer any questions you guys have about your ad adaptations. So thank you. <laughs>